Hello and welcome to another installment of At The Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At The Podium is a platform where we will learn from people who come from different walks of life, careers and experiences, but all share one thing in common. They have stepped fully into the transformative power of saying yes to the unexpected turns of their lives. And they're now using the power of their voice or a podium to make an impact on the world we live in today. At the podium is the intersection of art, culture, and big thoughts wrapped up in good old fashioned conversation. Today, I'm thrilled and humbled to share the podium with Ms. Jane C. Cho. Jane is an executive coach, consultant, and facilitator. For over 12 years, she has helped people and organizations build inclusive cultures that are welcoming to all. She has worked with organizations of all sizes in multiple industries, from large global companies, startups, community nonprofits, to colleges and universities, film studios, media, and entertainment. Jane Cho, welcome to At The Podium. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Patrick. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I am so, so glad to talk to you today. And you, you and I have been friends for a number of years. And I feel like today is just going to be a continuation of a long dialogue that you and I have shared for two decades, which yeah. is beautiful if you think about it. That's so true. So Jane, so Jane, you have, from your bio, you have created quite a career for yourself as an executive coach, as a consultant, and you've carved out this space really in leadership development and diversity, equity, and inclusion. But in a, a previous iteration of your life, the, the one where you and I first met, you had built a very accomplished career as an actress. You, were, you worked extensively in Hollywood, um, in theater around the US. Um, your degree, you have a degree from the Yale School of Drama. You also have a degree in performance studies from Northwestern. Um, I wanna know, because we talk about these transition moments for people, I wanna know, how did that journey unfold for you from this very vibrant theatrical Hollywood career to this space where you are literally transforming companies from the inside out? I always feel like the, each path kind of dovetails into another and, and they're simultaneous, right? You're, you're never only on one path at a time. And I think that was really true for me where you know, I started in the arts and in performance when I was a kid, you know, I started singing professionally when I was around in fourth grade. Um, my family was very into the arts and I went to a public school and my music teacher in fourth grade invited me to audition for this choir. And then I performed in this choir and then I got invited to, um, to record these records. So, you know, even when I was a, a really young child, I, I was very active in the arts with music. You know, I have artists in my family. And then, you know, in high school, you know, I was in all of the clubs, you know, theater and all of that. And then I went to college. And so during all of that, I never had a singular kind of goal of becoming an actor per se. I was always just kind of following my immediate interest. Um, and when I graduated from college, I went right into the theater. You know, I got my first job um, actually with Malik Pancholi. He was in my class at Northwestern. We both got hired um, our senior year of college at the Goodman Theater. And, um, you know, so, so during all of that time, I, I felt like I was never just doing one thing. It was always um, one, one path and then these kind of other things that were happening at the same time. And I think part of what has always served me is just following your interests, like staying engaged and staying interested, keeping your eye on the ball in terms of having goals and having a vision for what we want in life, but not, um, not being too kind of, you know, laser focused in a way that, um, that, that blocks out other things that also can be very rejuvenating, very engaging. And I feel like that's a, a way that my career uh, organically evolved from one thing to the next. And, and even now I feel like I'm not just doing one thing. And, you know, it, it's like, if, if you have to kind of write down what you do, um, you know, we're sort of in, 
asked to, to narrow it down so that it's legible and people can place you in a context that they can understand. But you know, in the way that we have one way we do something, there, there are other spaces that were also very active and very accomplished and very comfortable, but maybe it doesn't match up or um, make sense with other parts of our lives. So I think we tend to compartmentalize our own selves. And I think what has helped me is to really question that impulse. You know, do I have to compartmentalize myself? Do I have to define or, or can I be in a flow with something that's working for me that I enjoy, that's engaging where I'm finding success and also still do these other things that might feel a little tangential, you know, from a narrative perspective, but bring me great meaning and joy and, and accomplishment. So I think that has helped me um, evolve through all of the different phases of life, because I think there's a complexity that life demands that I think, especially when we think about our careers or work, um, we're not always able to embrace all of that. And I think, you know, there's a lot of power in saying, you know what, I think I'm going to see if I can embrace the complexity and see what happens. So it, it's kind of like, you know, when we were studying together, I remember one day we had a really fabulous moving movement teacher named Wesley Fada, who is an icon in the Yale community um, and, and taught everyone who came through that program until he recently retired. And I remember one day he said to us, you know, your career, and he was obviously talking about a career in the theater or on, on television or movies, whatever it was. He was like, your career is something that you can really only experience in the rearview mirror. He was like, as you're moving through your life, as you're moving through the sort of ups and downs and the turns that happen to you, the career is what is the result. It's not the process. And I think what you're kind of saying is that you, you've sort of been able to really embrace these different concepts of who you are, where your interests lie, and really go down that path of process and let the results kind of fall as they may fall. Is that sort of where you are on that? Yeah, I, I think it has to be a simultaneous attention where there's a really strategic aspect of your own career development, your goal setting, the things that you do to move your quote unquote career forward. I think that's really important. And there are really tactical things that we all can do to drive ourselves toward accomplishing those goals. At the same time, there's an undercurrent, I think, while we're doing that, while we're pursuing our career goals, while we're putting the work in to develop ourselves and all of those important things, there's, there's an undercurrent of, of an energy, a feeling, a sense that we have that is not as, we can't control it as much, right? And, and I think that's related to things like, does this feel good? Do I like this, right? And I think the ability to always stay in touch with that, that presence, that mindfulness, that uh, access to yourself, um, is going to inform whether or not we're going to make certain strategic choices about our career. So, so very practically, it can be like, okay, do I like my job? Am I happy in my job? Right. That's a very tactical, strategic question. And we can look at all of the plot points around that. Like, do I like the, my day to day? Do I like my manager? Do I like the people I work with? All, all of those questions. But I think there's just an, uh, uh, on a feeling level, you know, we can have a sense of, okay, is this satisfying? Does this really fill me up in the way that I need to be filled up in a deep, meaningful way versus, okay, I'm doing this job so that I can get this stuff so I can, you know, do, do life, right? I think, again, those things are important, but we have to also keep in mind um, the more emotional, spiritual, intuitive part of ourselves that help us know if we're on track with our lives. Um, and that's more unwieldy, I think. And I, and I think that, you know, when Wesley talks about this idea of our career, um, that can often be, you know, the results, like the, the, what you write down that you already did, right? And that never necessarily helps us know what to do next. You know, and I think I, I, you know, as an executive coach, I work with a lot of very successful people who feel like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> that was cool. But now what should I do next? And we realize, you know, we think about and understand human psychology, past success doesn't necessarily um, give us the, the meaning and the sense of purpose that that's going to help us know what to do next. It's great. I mean, success is very important. And, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, be, be, you know, undermine that in any, in any way, but it, it, you know, life is whole and complex. So we need to attend to all pieces of it so that we, you know, at the end of the day, feel like we're really in flow with what we came here to do. 
You know, it's interesting because I feel like as people are looking at, I'm walking down this one path and I, I think you have, a, you have always had an incredibly expansive view of the world and of your life and how you exist within that. Um, but a lot of people and, and walk through with a sense of, well, I went to drama school, I'm supposed to be an actor. I'm now an actor, and if I haven't been successful in that and I go do something else, I failed, right? I think, and I think, I think we, because we're, we're very label attached in the role that we live in, and we're very defined by, well, I did this, so therefore I must continue doing this, or I must continue being that, and then the shift happens. So when you're, when you're coaching people who are very successful people, and even for yourself, how, how do you manage that shift? Because that's the, I think the shift is, the heart of the matter in a way. Like how do you manage that shift from track A to track B? I think it's mindset is a, a big starting point. I think the notion of failure and success is a real hindrance for a lot of people. We are terrified of failing. We're sh ashamed and we feel all these big emotions about the, the fear of failure or being labeled a failure or seen as a failure, all, all of that stuff. And it's such a hindrance because there's always going to be a story that someone tells you about yourself. You're going to be told a story about who you are, right? From the day we're born, you're told, okay, this is what you are. This is what you can expect in life. This is what you deserve. This is what's for you. This other stuff is not for you. This is not you. This is not your path. This is not, you know, and that is all nonsense. I think we have to first listen most closely to our own story about ourselves. Right? And we have to kind of get very clear about what stories have I inherited? What stories have been transmitted to me? What's like the bag of stuff someone gave you that you're still holding? <laughs> that you're like, oh, this, this is not mine. <laughs> and I think we have to go through a process of, of deciding, uh, do we want to still carry some of the stuff that was given to us? It doesn't belong to us. And if we don't, put it down. And I think notions of success and failure are hugely um, you know, tied up in all of that. So I think even the notion of a shift, we can think of that, even that we can even problematize that because if we think of it as a shift, it's like, you know, you're on track A and then you got to jump the track and go on track B. And, and another way to think about it is just that there are multiple concurrent tracks. You're always on more than one track at a time, right? And they're always there and accessible and, and, and um, yours for the taking. And it's just a matter of choosing, okay, which one do I want to prioritize right now? And I always feel that um, you have to check in with that internal barometer. Okay, does, what, is this true for me? Is, where's, what, what track resonates with my truest self, with my most important, urgent um, goal and value, right? And, and I think when we think about changing the, 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 the plot of our lives, like even things like changing your career, changing your job, changing your lifestyle, changing something major about how you live your life. We have to really go down deep and, and use that compass of what's, what's the core value that, that animates your life. That I think can help make the more tactical decisions. Like for example, I work with a lot of women who uh, are trying to balance parenting and career. Oftentimes those two roles are um, in competition, right? So if you think about the multiple tracks available at once, you know, I, for myself personally, I have two children, um, you know, being a parent is as important as having a career to me, right? So these are these two different tracks that are happening at the same time <laughs> that I am on at the same time. So I can't like, if I try to jump from one to another back and forth, back and forth, it's, it's exhausting. I think a lot of women and, and men too, you know, both men, you know, fathers and mothers are really struggling with that. And we're in a moment, I think, where all of, all of these things are being reconsidered and reexamined. So I, I think uh, part of a way to think about ch change in your life is to uh, see if we can think of it in a way where we don't have to pick one over another or sacrifice something in order to gain something else, but rather how can we have a more holistic, more integrated, more, uh, I hate the word balanced, but a, a more um, a, a more reasonable way of being in the world where we don't have to pick only one priority in our lives. Because I think we can do more than one thing at a time, um, but I, you know, I, 
I think making those decisions has to be deeply rooted in our own core value system. You know, what's really interesting about the approach that you're taking and the approach that we're taking in this conversation today, Jane, is that um, many of the other people I've spoken to um, and probably will speak to um, have talked about this sense of shifting, this mm -hmm. transformative power of saying yes in, in, a, in a sort of either or scenario. And what you're really talking about is this idea of things can, there can be unity. Yeah. And that it's not necessarily a break. It is, it is a unifying experience to go from one direction to another direction. And that potentially you've been doing that all along. Yeah. And you may be foregrounding something and backgrounding something based upon the given circumstances of your life, your family, et cetera. Absolutely. Like I, I always say that, um, you know, when we think about healing, we, we have to, or, or growth, you know, you can't amputate, amputate your way into healing or growth, right? Like we can't like remove something or like chop something off or cut something off in order to be whole or to be, you know, to grow. We, ha we have to take, we have to, I think that it's a mindset sh set shift where instead of deciding, okay, we're going to give all of that up <laughs> and do this other new thing. No, I, I think we have to see that, you know, there's a reason why we've maybe held things that are in conflict in our lives, right? Like, I think a lot of us struggle with a certain level of internal conflict. You know, we want this one thing, but we kind of also want this other thing and they feel like they're in conflict. And that might very well be true. Like you can't always do every single thing you want. Sometimes you do have to prioritize certain things, foreground th certain things, and then, you know, deprioritize and like put other things in the background. That's reality. But I think where we can kind of get in our own way is when we start telling that secondary storyline of, well, since I'm putting this other thing in the background, I'm a bad person or I'm failing or I'm letting everyone down or, you know, whatever negative narrative that we have associated with making those shifts um, or re you know, reshuffling your deck, you know, putting different things in the first position. Um, and, I, and I think the other way that we might get, get a little more spaciousness around how we think about our lives and how we can make decisions is that um, it's not a permanent decision forever, right? Like for me as a parent, I knew that when I had my kids, I really wanted to be a parent in a certain type of way that was more time intensive than in the way that I grew up. So I knew, okay, I'm not going to be able to be on the road three months a year. I don't want to be in a, in a career where I'm going to be out of, you know, out of town a lot or that I won't be able to attend, you know, parent teacher conferences and school plays and all of those things. So I knew, okay, I'm going to have to reshuffle a little bit because that role as a parent, especially when my kids were zero to five, I wanted to be there. So that parenting role and responsibility was in first position. That didn't mean that I couldn't do the other things I wanted to do, but it did, you know, there's a limited number of time, you know, hours of day in the day and energy that you have. So I was able to figure out a way where I could still stay true to my core values, to what I, what was most important to me without amputating anything or leaving everything behind. You know, there's a way that you can find, you know, some sense of, of wholeness um, without feeling like you have to give something up completely. Mm. Mm. Did that surprise you that you made that choice from zero to five for your kids? Because you and I are close to the same age. We were, we were kind of raised a little feral. Like they were like, here's the key. Don't turn on the stove. I'll see <laughs> yeah. you when I get home. Yeah. We, and, were and like, we were like yeah, Gen X, you know, we're ch I was a child of immigrants. It was like, you know, I'll see you at seven o'clock. <laughs> You're going to go to school, right? Okay, get on that. That's the bus, right? Yeah. You know, so, so it was just a different time. It was a different, different, you know, context. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I, I always kind of knew that intuitively, that was something that I wanted. And when I actually, I had my kids later in life, you know, in my late thirties, I had my first child. I knew that there was a certain type of parent I wanted to be. And it was difficult because, you know, to be very honest, it was not, you know, intuitive for me. It was definitely something that I had to think about, put a lot of effort in, you know, I read a lot of parenting books, um, but it, it was uh, it, it was a, an intentional decision to deprioritize, you know, career progress, career success, not success necessarily, but, you know, I wasn't like hitting the gas on my career as much during those first five years of my kids' lives, because I knew, you know, I wanted to still be working and still be, um, you know, developing my career, but I was also very, very focused on being home with my kids. Amazing. There's a the, the word that keeps coming into my mind is sort of like, you know, patience -ism. Yeah. And priorityism. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I absolutely. I, I think that as people think about where they currently are, the present moment of their lives and looking, you know, just checking out the scene, like what's, where am I? Where, where am I? What's happening? What am I doing? And keeping in sight a goal, you know, what's the direction I want to go in? What's required for me to move in that direction? Um, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing question, right? You don't have to you know, you know, sell all your stuff, <laughs> you know, quit your job. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and I think psychologically, we feel that we do because there's some notion in our mind about commitment and being all in on something. And, and I, I just question that. And I, and if anything, I would, I would invite people who are listening to question that. Do you feel you have to give everything up in order to have the life you want? I don't know Ooh. that that's the case. I don't think you have to. Maybe you do, I don't know, but I would, I would question that. Is there a way that you can move toward your goal without amputating something, without giving everything up? And sometimes actually the answer is yes, you do have to give everything up. And, and I only ask that because we don't ask ourselves the question. There are certain things that like, yeah, you're gonna have to give everything up. If this is a change you wanna make, you are gonna have to give everything up but maybe not. <laughs> and I think we, I think being judicious, thoughtful, intentional, mindful about how we're thinking about our lives, how we're thinking about the choices that we have, um, that's going to help us feel more free, feel more empowered and not victimized mm. and not trapped. And I think for all of us who've been enduring COVID, the horror that we've all experienced that we're all currently still experiencing, this is a daily question. You know, can I, is there a way that I can you know, maintain sanity in my home, maintain balance, and yet still accomplish all the things that we need to accomplish. Um, it's a continuous process of evaluation mm -hmm. and choice. So I, you know, I, I, I think we, I think it will serve us to open up the frame, you know, to just open up the way we're thinking about all of these givens that have been in place for forever and a day, uh, especially when we think about, you know, some of the work that I do around diversity, equity, and inclusion, these, these historical, um, powerful legacies, this inertia that touches practically every single thing in our lives. Um, it's time to question those things. It's time to pause and question um, and try to reimagine something different. And I think, especially with diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're trying to work towards something that doesn't exist yet. Mm. No one has figured this out. So we need to be very, very creative, very bold, very courageous in the way we think about things, the way we question what's come down the chute up until this moment and make bold, courageous, thoughtful decisions in a, from a place of feeling empowered um, and trusting ourselves because you can trust yourself. Jane, you literally have just taken my breath away by something you just said. When you talk about, sometimes you have to give up something to have the life that you want. You do. And I think that's, and that, and that's the key for people, right? Like I think people who are in that moment of transition, part of the process is the realizing I do have to give up something and it may be everything. Part of what I'm really speaking to is make sure you're giving up the right thing, right? Make sure you have a clear and correct analysis of your current state, right? What, like, I, th I think especially when we think about career change, there are specific things that we fear to give up. And I think having a clear understanding of what that is can help us you know, wade through the emotionality of, of these types of decisions. Like, are you afraid of giving up your salary? Are you afraid of giving up security? Are you afraid of giving up your identity as whatever that might be, right? Mm. Um, especially, you know, we see ourselves as a certain type of person. Um, and you know, for me, I, I still consider myself an actor. I am an actor. I'm, I will always be an actor because that is my training. That's my love. That's my passion. Currently, I'm not making my living as an actor, but that doesn't negate or diminish my identity as an artist, as a creative person, as an actor. And that is completely connected to the process of reclaiming your own narrative. You are the author of your narrative. You cannot let someone else tell you who you are ever, ever, because yes. they don't know. They don't know. First of all, they don't know you. Second of all, they don't know. And also... Uh, 
we were living in a historical context where 50 years ago, you and I would probably not be able to sit here talking about this, right? So right. we have that legacy that needs revision. Like we need to rebut some of that. And um, we, we all internalize stories that are told to us about us that are not true. So I feel that the work of being here in this in, on this earth is to clarify your own story, to know yourself, to know why you're here, to know what you're doing and to share your energy, to share your gifts. And if anyone's external story is messing with that, then just ignore that. That's a dumb story that doesn't have anything to do with you. You know your story. And I, I think that that is the ground, you know, and you get to write your story. You get to say what happens mm. next. You get to decide how it ends to some extent. <laughs> And, you know, also it's, there's a mystery, you know, life is a mystery. So right, all, right, of, right. all of those things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, you're taking me to church right now because I think, you know, you're, you're like speaking to like, like my, my soul. And I think, I think it's the message that the world needs to hear right now that you don't get to decide other people's narratives and stories. You don't get to put other you as your own individual person gets to decide who you are and how you exist in this world. You get to write your own narrative. And I think oftentimes we are hindered because we've allowed other people to define our narratives. And it's very hard to sort of stand up and let that go. Because yeah. then what are you left with? Once, once you take away someone else's narrative, you are really responsible for what happens yes. next. Yeah, so, so all that like victimhood has to go. Like that, that sense of, oh, I, you know, they did it to me. Somebody did it to me. Somebody, no, I, I like those things are real experiences of feeling disenfranchised. All those things are real. At the same time, we have agency. Like we have a, a private space that belongs to us, our own mind that we are in charge of. That's ours. No one can take that. No one gets to take that. Right. Um, and I think being able to connect with that and to feel the power of that and to just practice that can help us as we navigate all of the, all of the change that we're all experiencing right now um, and, and be guided by choices that are our choices, not what somebody else expects of us or wants us to do or is convenient for their story. You know, I think something that can be hard is sometimes we realize we've been cast in someone else's story of like, oh, you're wanting me to behave in this type of way because of your story about who I am. And a lot of times we just by inertia or by other forces, we feel like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll enact that role for you, for your story, for your convenience. And when that happens, we have to, we have to hit that pause button and be like, wait a minute, do I want to be part of that? And if you don't, sometimes it can be painful to, to remove yourself, you know, and, and, and that can come in the form of certain negative relationships. If you have a negative dynamic with people in your life where they expect you to be a certain type of way, they, they, uh, they're comfortable with you being a certain type of way. And if you don't want to be that way anymore, that's not going to be necessarily a welcome thing. So, you know, part of the process is being prepared for that. You know, no one's going to be that happy, <laughs> but you can handle it. You know, you can handle it. And I think the more empowered we are, the more centered we are in our own values, our own vision for our life, the more free we are. And that, I, I feel like that's the goal. We want to be free. You want to be free to talk to anyone you want, to go into any kind of space you want, confident and powerful in yourself so that you know why you're here and what you're doing and that you're free to share the gifts that you have to give. Because there's a lot of it. You know, you've got a lot of gifts. Everyone does. Um, and I think that is, that's to me, that's a beautiful and, and very humbling process to engage in. I think it's beautiful that, I think it's wonderful that you're kind of flipping the script on this conversation to where you're saying, yeah, all of this is hard. It's not easy. You got to make choices. You got to write your own narrative, take responsibility. But at the same time, it's beautiful. It is. It's worth it. That's that's what I would say at the end of the day. And you know, I think something we have to think about that I know I've thought about this a lot with COVID this last 18 months is, you know, we all think we have a million years to figure it out, but we really don't. You know, it's like the story is written where there's a there's an end point. Like the, the clock is going to run out at some point. We don't know when. And so let's, let's get started. <laughs> Let, let's, let's get started right now. Like, what yeah. are we waiting for? Like, what are we waiting for? Because we're not going to necessarily feel more comfortable tomorrow <laughs> yeah. or the next day. You know, I think this is urgent work. You know, we're really all being called to question our priorities, our habits, the inertia that maybe we've been in. What is the stuff that we're carrying that no longer belongs to us, that isn't useful, that we don't even care about or like? 
and, and just in a very pragmatic way, you know, we're, um, we're kind of getting ready for back to school. So we're going through the house of, okay, clothes that doesn't fit anymore, books that my kids are, you know, too old to look at anymore. Just th that kind of thing. When you look around your house, I'm like, why do I even still have that picture up on the wall? I don't even like that picture. But it's like, oh, somebody gave it to me. <laughs> I feel bad. I don't know what to do with it. It's like, it's time to really get uh, a little bit more focused on, you know, being more, more um, centered in our own vision for our lives and being responsible to that. I'm just letting that sit for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Throw away your old stuff. Throw away your... Those gifts that people gave, gave you, sorry, sorry, relatives. <laughs> like the handwritten <laughs> cards that are like gifts. We've enjoyed it. Now we can, <laughs> you know, let it flow. <laughs> let your life flow. <laughs> Jane, where do what? Where do you get your inspirations for this type of work around self-examination, social justice, racial justice, equity? Where does that? What inspires you to do that work? Because it's so important and it's so hard. I think when I, when I look back at all of the experiences I've had in my life, I can think of certain moments where I have felt uh, it, altern or alternatively um, really prepared and powerful in responding to things that were happening around me and also totally, totally powerless. You know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, my, my family was, uh, you know, we, my parents emigrated from Korea in the early seventies. We were like the only Korean family in our town. It was mostly a white town and, you know, just various incidents of, you know, racism that I experienced that my siblings experienced that my parents experienced. And as, and as a child, I knew something was happening, but I didn't know what to do or what to say, but I, I just, there was a feeling of something is wrong here. And I remember as I went through different experiences and as I got older, I would think, oh, you know, maybe I could say this, maybe I should have handled it like that. You know, maybe there's a way that I could have changed something if I were older, if I were more mature, if I were more, you know, articulate or whatever, you know, the way a child would think of how, how you could handle a situation like that. And, you know, of course, you know, and across the board, right, in all different stages of life, these moments happen. And I, uh, I, I read a writer describe how um, she said that, you know, racism will find you where you stand. No matter who you are, no matter where you, where you are, you know, wherever you are, whoever you are, racism will find you where you stand because this is the world that we live in. So when that happens, what are you gonna do? Are you prepared to answer that? Are you pre prepared to respond to that? Whether you are the target, whether you are a bystander, whether you can be an ally, you know, there, this, this is something that the dynamic that has always been in human history and it's happening now. So I feel very inspired because I feel every single person has a part to play because we're, again, whatever your identity, all of the, you know, in, inequalities that exist, racism, sexism, ableism, you know, all of the ways in which we dehumanize each other, that will come to you and it will find you and it will meet you where you stand. So we each have an opportunity all the time to answer that moment. And so the work that I do, like, I'm so inspired to, um, for my own self in the work to more deeply understand that, like, why? <laughs> Why do we, why, why do we have to be like that? You know, I don't, I don't think we have to be so hateful or so fearful of each other, first of all. And then I think there are ways that we can move the needle, that we can, you know, educate ourselves and influence one another in love, in respect, and really just acknowledging each other's humanity, um, first and foremost. And so in everything that I do and all the work that I do, I, that's, that's at the heart of it. And, you know, when I think about the theater or acting, isn't that really the, the first thing to acknowledge another's humanity and their fullness as a human being and all of the thoughts, feelings, desires, pain, all of the things that make a character, right? To be an actor is to try to embody and understand all of those things with empathy to, to, to create a performance that, uh, you know, the good, the great performances really capture the fullness of that human experience. So to me, there's an in integrity to all of that. Um, and what I love about the, the work I get to do now is helping companies turn those practices into policies so that work is more welcoming, 
more supportive and more, more successful. We have decades of data that show that uh, companies that really get diversity, equity, and inclusion right are more successful. They're more competitive. They're, you know, by all the metrics, they're far superior than the ones that are really operating on these really outdated ways of, of doing business. So, you know, it's an exciting time to be in the conversation. Um, it's so urgent because people's lives are at stake and we, it's time, like we have to move the needle in a meaningful way. And everyone has a responsibility to do that in their own way, in their own place, um, in their own, in their own context. And so, so, you know, there's, there's so much to be done. And I, I, you know, I feel very, very passionate about um, making change while I get to be here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm taking it in because I, I, I think it really, you know, kind of like now is the time. Yeah. And we can start really small. Like we don't have to necessarily, you know, go out and you know change the entire world by the end of the week, you know, just think about your own context. Like even in, in the next five days, if we think about, you know, what, what's on your to-do list, what are we doing? You know, wh what can you do? Where can you, um, you know, make choices that are going to, uh, you know, move you toward your goal, even if it's one small thing. You know, I, I love the idea of, you know, actionable um, items on your to-do list, right? If actionable goals, right? You know, the, what are five things you can do? Or let's say two things you can do in the next 48 hours that are, that's going to move you closer to what you want to be doing, you know, to close, closer to your vision for your future. Um, again, it doesn't have to be everything all at once. I, I think that can feel really overwhelming to people and can shut people down. And then they kind of revert back to whatever inertia they're in. I think just keeping it, you know, having the, the big vision in mind, but also kind of bringing it down to earth of like, okay, this is where I am right now. You know, here are the, the you know, in, in two weeks, this is what I think I can accomplish. Um, you know, in a month, this is, you know, these are, you know, a couple of things I can do. In three months, I want to see myself over here. Um, and again, without necessarily, you know, shutting everything else down, it can be a concurrent process. I think that's, that's, that's one of my biggest takeaways from talking to you today is that these processes are not individuated. They are together. Mm -hmm. They are one. Jane, I, I cannot thank you enough for your time today and your willingness to share your wisdom and voice with us. I, I'm really grateful to you for today. You're welcome. It's a total pleasure to talk to you always, Patrick. Yes. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. And to those of you who are watching and listening, remember, you, we all have a voice. So use yours wisely.